right, I'm on the opposite side. Okay. Thanks. Good evening. Welcome to the regular meeting of the Brisbane Planning Commission, Thursday, August 28th, 2014, 7.30 p.m. Brisbane City. On. Uh-oh. What did you do? Testing, testing, testing. Testing, 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 testing. Testing, testing. Testing. Hello. Whoa. Oh. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> Hello. Okay, we're pretty loud now. I'm going to turn it down just a here, so oh, I don't yell at everybody. Yeah, that's good. Okay, let's try that again. <laughs> Welcome everybody to the regular meeting of the Brisbane Planning Commission, Thursday, August 28th, 2014, 7.30 p.m. Brisbane City Hall. Uh, call to order. Commissioner Cunningham? Present. Commissioner Doe? Present. Commissioner Parker? Here. The record show Commissioner Muneer and Reinhardt are absent. Uh, item C, adoption of the agenda. I'd like to adopt the agenda. I motion that we adopt the agenda. And I second that. All in favor? Yeah, Aye. Aye. Yeah, just um, item D is oral communications. Um, it's a limit of 15 minutes for any item that is not on tonight's agenda. Is there anybody in our audience who would like to speak on a matter that is not on the agenda this evening? Okay, I see nobody interested, so I'll make a motion to close oral communications. I close the oral communications. Uh, in written communications, um, what I have here is from Heart of San Mateo County, um, the Housing Endowment and Regional Trust of San Mateo County, and nothing else. Anybody else have anything no. that I don't have? Okay. No. Okay, moving on. Uh, new business. Uh, this is a public hearing, draft 2015, uh, the 2015 to 2022 Housing Element General Plan Amendment GPA-1-14 City of Brisbane Applicant Citywide. Stuff. Yes, thank you. I'll turn the lights down a little bit here. Tonight's meeting on the housing element represents the culmination of eight study sessions by the Planning Commission over the last six months and provides the Commission an opportunity to review the draft document as a whole and take public comment prior to the Commission's recommendation to City Council. Note that this is an update of the 2007 to 2014 housing element, and so it's not an entirely new document. I'll begin by briefly reviewing the purpose and background of the housing element, followed by an outline of the Regional Housing Needs Allocation, or RENA, as it pertains to Brisbane, and um, also how the housing element addresses the RENA through the existing zoning and proposed rezoning sites. Then Tim will wrap up with a review of the key policy and program changes. So um, to start with uh, the purpose and background, the, uh, the, the plan, the housing element, uh, addresses the needs of all economic segments of the city's population, and this is balanced with other issues such as land use and environmental. It's uh, a required element by the state, um, and it's generally updated every seven years. It's uh, to consist of identification and analysis of existing and projected housing needs, uh, statements of goals, policies, objectives, uh, addressing financial resources, also scheduled programs for preservation and the improvement and development of housing. Um, it's also to 
identify adequate sites for housing, and this is in the various categories listed here. The uh, 2007 to 2014 housing element was adopted in, in 2011, so it was a little bit off its cycle, so we just reviewed it not too long ago. Um, the proposed rezoning of Southwest Bayshore was removed from consideration from that element, and, um, and also the NCRO3 district has not yet been rezoned, so in essence, it's, this is the opportunity to, to reconsider all of that, which the Planning Com Commission has done through the study sessions. Uh, this cycle represents a reduced rain, a substantially reduced for this, uh, for this cycle, and I'll, I'll have a slide to follow on that. Um, some key updates for this, uh, things that were considered um, as part of this, uh, the study sessions was uh, update of the demographic data, including the 2010 census. Uh, details of accomplishments from the last housing element are addressed in this, this draft. It incorporates changes due to the elimination of the redevelopment agency by the state. As I mentioned, there's a reduced RENA, but because of the, uh, the rezoning that did not happen with Southwest Bayshore and the NCRO3 district, there's a partial RENA carryover for that. Um, it incorporates input from the Urban Land Institute, the technical advisory panel from earlier this year. Um, uh, the commission considered various other sites through the study sessions and, um, and has proposed a modification uh, of the rezoning, the previously proposed rezoning to address the arena. So uh, again, there were eight study sessions. Essentially, uh, what's addressed, uh, the, the main uh, things that are addressed in this update of the housing element is, is a proposed overlay district, which would include the three park lane sites on the, on the uh, excuse me, the south side of Park Lane, and then the mixed-use overlay district, the two park place sites. Uh, also proposed updates of the policies and programs are reflected. So this uh, chart just outlines the carryover um, along with the, the current cycle, RENA, which combined results in the, the number of 293 is the RENA for this housing element. The real driver is the very low to moderate income categories, which, which essentially have the zoning requirements of minimum density, which, which are addressed uh, in the housing element. Uh, this slide you have as table 35 in, in the draft element, it essentially, and sorry, it's a little hard to see on the screen here, but, but the current zoning shortfalls is uh, again it's driven in the very low low and moderate income categories and that's 225 is the shortfall versus what the current zoning allows for um, with the proposed rezoning it it results in a uh, excess of 53 in the very low to to low categories but the moderate category is is 50 under which gives a net essentially of three over in those three categories, since uh, very low and low would also be affordable to moderate. So this is just an overview slide of uh, citywide where we have zoning existing for housing as well as what's been considered and what's proposed. So the sites that were also considered are in blue, um, and the proposed sites are in red here. And the rest, of course, um, most of it is central Brisbane. We have the Northeast Ridge, which is, is wrapping up. Essentially, all the building permits for the nor Northeast Ridge have been issued, but we don't expect to see that. The final um, certificates of occupancy issued on the last units would probably be around this time next year. So they're, they're well underway, but uh, still in process. So focusing in a little bit more, the uh, proposed sites for rezoning, we have 25 and 41 to 43 Park Place, 
and this would be as a residential affordable housing overlay. Um, then the south side of Park Lane, 91 to 145. Park Lane would be as a residential affordable housing overlay. I think I said residential on the Park Place, mixed use Park Place. Um, the density on, on Park Place would be at a minimum of 20 units per acre. Um, the minimum on the Park Lane would be at 26 units an acre. Um, there was a, a proposal by the commission in the, the last study session to have a kind of a gradational uh, zoning, but due to the common ownership on all three sites, it, it, it made sense to keep these as, as the same density across the three because you have uh, ability to do lot line shifts with it all in the same ownership and essentially make that density um, kind of a moot point, if you will. So, um, so 26 is, is what's proposed there. Um, with that, I'll, I'll turn it over to Tim and walk you through policies and program changes. The updated housing element includes a number of new and significantly revised policies and programs. A broader approach to the streamlined design review required by state law in the new affordable housing zoning overlays is proposed in program HD1C. This should give the city more flexibility in meeting the zoning deadline while allowing at least three-story development as previously recommended by HCD and other incentives detailed in section 3.1.5 of the housing element to provide higher density housing. In addition, a new requirement for shared public access easements, such as walkways and fire lanes, would encourage connectivity between sites and neighboring districts. Regulations to provide a transition or buffer between potentially incompatible uses may be needed with the proposed affordable housing overlays near commercial warehouse uses in Crocker Park and the Brisbane Village. So a new policy HD2 is proposed. To implement this, two new programs are recommended. Program HD2A would consider zoning map or text amendments for non-residential sites in the immediate vicinity, such as the post office and 125 Valley Drive, to encourage compatible uses and development. New program HD2B would require review of the TC1, NCR01, and NCR02 districts to determine whether, for example, the regulations for freight forwarders, night operations, and wireless telecommunications facilities need to be revised or clarified. To encourage development of secondary dwelling units, program HB1D would be revised to include the option of reducing or eliminating the administrative fee for secondary units which agree to rent restrictions. A new program HB1E would reduce the fee for units created within the building envelope of existing single-family residences, explore the potential for a loan program for second unit construction, Work with Landmark at the Ridge property owners to consider amending the Northeast Ridge PD permit to allow conversion of existing floor area within building envelopes to accommodate second units. Provide technical assistance to streamline the process for owners and encourage well-designed second units that meet the city standards. And publicize these programs as they are implemented. To help fund affordable rental housing, revised program HH1A would call for considering adoption of a housing impact fee and or commercial linkage fee to be collected from developers of market rate housing and commercial projects to compensate for the demand for affordable housing such development can be documented to secondarily generate. Policy HB9 is proposed to be revised to consider funding affordable housing with that portion of property taxes that would have gone to the redevelopment agency but is now boomeranging back to the city from the county. In conclusion, staff recommends that the Planning Commission adopt Resolution GPA-1-14-A, recommending that the City Council forward the draft 2015-2022 housing element to the California Department of Housing and Community Development for a review prior to formal adoption of the housing element by the city later this year. Are there any questions for staff? Carla? Um, I have a oh, I wanted to let you know that I did contact Landmark um, up at the Ridge and let them know that this is being proposed, and um, I thought they should at least know. And um, I have some questions. 
on J, attachment J. It says the HIP HIP housing matching with low income since 1977. Uh, so this program started in 1977. Let's see, did I have any questions about that? Well, hold on. What I'm page sorry. are you on, Carolyn? So how long, how, I have some questions about HIP. So the HIP housing home sharing program has been in existence since 1977. Um, I, I wanted to know, has Brisbane used this program uh, since 1977 or, or so it has? I, I don't go back that far uh -huh. um, with the housing element per se, but um, we have had this program in the element for a number of cycles now, um, and I believe that uh, we typically get one or two households that actually participate in the program. Um, so it, it, it does have a, a purpose here in Brisbane. So they just come down to Brisbane City Hall and, and find out about it? or, or how? Well, um, the city publicizes uh, it, its programs through the, the website, generally, um, and we may do other things as well with some of the um, newsletters that go out. But um, the city isn't actually involved specifically in the administration of the program. So it, it's uh, somehow if someone gets into the county system, then they can, uh, someone would tell them about the program and they could contact um, Brisbane or wherever. Right. Okay, I have some other questions on attachment E, F1E, um, F1E9. I found that confusing. Um, actually, I think it's 10. It's item C. Um, so it says the Department of Housing and Community Devel Development may allow a city or city county to substitute the provisions of units for up to 25% of the community's obligation to identify adequate sites for income category in its housing element pursuant to paragraph 1 of subdivision where the community... So what does this mean? Excuse me, Carolyn, can you tell us where you're at? Uh, F1E, I'm sorry, not 910. And that's number C. And that's attachment number E. That and that's the um, government code section. That, that's the government code. And subsection C uh, talks about units that have been substantially rehabilitated with assistance from the city or county. Um, and I think we discussed this in one of the uh, study sessions that Brisbane doesn't actually have anything that would qualify for this particular um, provision in the government code. Okay. So that's why we don't address it. And then again on, on um, F1E12, uh, for the purposes of the subdivision, that doesn't pertain to us either? That's correct. Okay. Um, let's see if I have some other questions here. Uh, page 1E22, um, lands preserved or... Pre so what I wanted to know is uh, C and D, it sounded like uh, that these programs would not be honored. Is that correct? Because I was reading from... Um, number one, it says each member's juridis jurisdiction existing and projected. Anyway, it sounded to me as though um, 
the urban development may exclude. What what does this mean? I, I just don't quite understand C and D on page one e twenty two. Does that mean we are allowed to ex keep the exemption? It's really an identification of potential constraints within a community that could preclude or limit the ability to provide housing. So the idea of having protected open space, for example, would be the idea of putting housing within those areas would be conflicting and contradictory with other open space preservation policies and goals. And so I think that's where getting back to what some of the constraints are for achieving our, you know, a jurisdiction may have for housing. Limited infrastructure is another potential constraint. These are all just potential constraints on on a, a community's ability to uh, to achieve the housing uh, goals. Okay, so that's acknowledged by the state. All right. Uh, and then 1E43. Um, item C, the legislature also recognizes that premature and unnecessary development of agriculture. So this means that um, the agricultural land may be protected or? That's correct. Okay. So these are safeguards that were built into this document. Okay, and then on page F1E49, um, item B, and 2 and C and 1 are talking about water and sewage services. So, So, th so the sewage system is set up, and then it's pr it's protected. Is that correct? I'm just kind of in, in in limbo about some of these. So this means that the um, water that we've allocated for the developments um, stand, or If, if you read subsection A above, this is in reference to prioritizing the availability of, of these services for, for low-income housing projects. That's uh -huh. really the context. So again, what they're saying is that a water supplier is supposed to, on a five-year basis, indicate how they're going to make those allocations for servicing these low and prioritized uh, kind of housing forms and types, yes. Okay. That's, that's, uh, Thank you. I just didn't quite understand some of these. And then what about five? This, again, pertains to water on um, 1E49. Uh, so that, again, is says that we, uh, these, the water supply is protected for the low and moderate housing, or is that... 5D1 and 2. Uh, what, that's the last page. Okay, I guess my question is that in Brisbane, if um, we have set aside some water for um, increasing the new developments, except f so as, as in the near future, how much water allocation do we have for new developments? Is there um, a certain supply that's... The city has a certain supply that we have through the uh, Bowska, which is our mm -hmm. water wholesaler. Um, 
and to my understanding of the public works uh, improvement planning over the years that they've projected adequate water supply uh, for development sort of infill development and planned growth within the the core of the city um, and the there are shortfalls when you're anticipating development of the baylands for example there, there are shortfalls of water supply there hasn't been a identified water supply for that our current allocations would not address that but um, historically um, general plan projected growth within the the city excluding the baylands the they've indicated there is adequate water supply so what about the area that um, i'm trying to remember the name of the area that's uh, right by seven mile how or or across from industrial way um it does that ha what is it called the levinson property the levinson property is th is there water allocated for that if someone wants to come and develop it or we don't know the city doesn't really reserve water for on a lot by lot or a specific property related um, that's not how they allocate water there's no water reserved for any given property uh, when a development proposal is made part of the environmental review typically is to ensure that there's adequate water supply and so it'll be based on the conditions when an application is made on a property to determine that there's no allocation of water for a particular undeveloped site the baylands might be treated differently if they bring their own water in or have to supply their own water then obviously it would be allocated for their purposes but in town no there's no allocation for vacant lots for future use so it's just on a as needed as needed basis okay And on um, attachment I, 15-17, uh, uh, when does Brisbane receive the lump sum of money from the redevelopment, new, the redevelopment I mean, agency? Has that come to the city yet? I'm not, I'm not seeing the. Um, I may look at the wrong page. What, what I, page are you know, referring to? I think to? I do have the wrong page. Oh, I guess it's 1J17. Uh, no. I'm sorry, I still can't. My attachment J only has four pages. Really? It's the hip housing is attached. I'm to sorry, it. I have the wrong one. Uh, I. I. Okay. No wonder we can't find it. I-17. When the redevelopment, I, I know what the question is. When the redevelopment agency um, disbanded and we're supposed to receive a lump sum, does the city know at this point what the lump sum is going to be and are we receiving it anytime soon? That's my question. I'm not really that familiar. I'm not familiar with the redistribution uh, of those prior redevelopment monies. I think this was intended on a, uh, I mean, the policies that speak about a boomerang fund uh -huh. was really a revenue stream kind of going forward basis. Certain dollars, if redevelopment had been in place, a certain number of dollars would be set aside by the redevelopment agency for low and moderate income housing. That was statutory you know, condition of redevelopment. So the, the, the whole idea behind the boomerang concept is that the city would voluntarily, instead of just those monies going, you don't get all the money, right, because of the money that what it was going to the redevelopment agency is now being spread around multiple taxing agencies. Mm -hmm. But whatever portion came back to the city, 
you know, the idea is that the city would voluntarily choose to set aside a percentage of those dollars for housing, low and moderate income housing, as opposed to just putting them into the general fund. That, that, that's it's basically a policy decision for the council ultimately if they want to earmark money for that kind of purpose or whether they you know, want to do that or they want to have maximum flexibility, let those monies go into the general fund and they can allocate them amongst all the city's uh, requirements. So it's really a policy question for the council. If they're willing and interested in doing that, they have the ability to do so. And that's all we're suggesting is they consider if they're interested in doing that. Okay, I think that's all my questions. Thank you. I had questions in regards to the, the two submissions in response to the draft. So I'm not sure if now is the time since uh, Ms. Dilworth has not spoken. Um, you should ask staff okay. if they have anything to answer. Okay. So I was wondering that there were issues raised in Ms. Dilworth's um, letter, and how does the draft address those issues? Oh, I don't have a copy of that either. Can you be specific? Okay. Um, specifically, the numbers that are given in the carryover requirements. Ken will pull it up, but he basically calculated based on what we actually developed or what was developed over the last cycle. So we got credit for that against our 2007 to 2014 RENA. And that's basically where he came over with the carryover. What we did not, the, the deficit of what we were obligated to provide for and what we actually achieved in that planning cycle. So Ken can walk you through that if, if that's of interest. Right. This, this doesn't show, I guess, the, the finer details. It summarizes the, the numbers. The, the first, the RAINA carryover column 2007 to 14 on, on the screen there is uh, 89 very low, 54 low, and 67 moderate. So that was that um, portion of our previous RAINA that, that was not rezoned for that. The previous RAINA had a, a total of 401 uh, as an allocation for Brisbane, and it, it had a breakdown, essentially, of the very low to moderate income categories. And so the city had designated the sites, um, the NCRO3, which would be the three sites, um, two of which are still um, as part of this element, the third being 125 Valley Drive, and then, of course, Southwest Bayshore sites, which none of those actually were rezoned, and, and state law requires that if, if you have not rezoned to allow for that housing to occur, then essentially those numbers get carried forward to the next housing element. So we're not carrying forward the full 401 because that difference essentially between 401 and 210 here, um, we already have had with current zoning. So it's just that portion that didn't get rezoned to actually allow for housing. Okay. And then um, in terms of the recommendations made by HIP Housing, are we taking into consideration the um, social constraints and the government, governmental constraints that are listed in uh, HIP Housing's letter? Sp specifically about the underwater mortgages and foreclosure crisis. The city's responsibility is to address the governmental constraints. Um, the housing element talks about um, the constraints that 
the whole housing finance industry um, is involved with. Um, but it's the governmental constraints that the housing element specifically addresses because many of those issues are beyond the city's control. Um, And actually, if you read through their comments, it basically says that cities have very few tools that they can use. Yes, it does. Uh, I, mean, I guess the reason I was asking is because, I guess, um, the social constraints impact the governmental considerations, meaning the roles that we as commissioners play. And so I was just wondering how much of that factors into our decision about op options. And I think the city has mainly relied in the past upon the first-time home buyers program, which was financed through the redevelopment agency. And we have a policy or program um, that talks about essentially turning that over um, to the um, housing authority and trying to generate funds to continue to finance that um, and also relying upon the county's programs um, that address the same issue. Um, the county has a the HOME, H-O-M-E program. Um, that essentially, I think, has kind of taken over what the city had done with the first-time home buyers program. So we'd be working with the county on that. And that includes the programs like BMR, right? Below market rates, or uh, um, well, BMR units. I, I think, in terms of the city's involvement, would be through the inclusionary housing ordinance, um, where we would require that a certain percentage of units uh, in for sale projects be set aside for low or moderate income households. That's already on the books. Mm -hmm. And in here, um, HIP housing specifically talks a lot about the home sharing aspects, but I think that we've incorporated that in our changes that we had discussed in previous meetings, yes? Right. Okay. Good. Okay. Um, I have a couple of questions and comments regarding the um, environmental uh, study, attachment H. Um, what I don't see in here is any comments relative to the fact that if we go ahead with this, that um, we are putting housing in an area where there are telecommunication towers and that that would be an impact and how are we going to address that? Question number one. You know that the FCC has superseded local jurisdictions regulations of telecommunications facilities on the basis of electromagnetic impacts. The city council approached that through more of an aesthetic um, control in um, essentially prohibiting them in any residential district. We talk about taking a look at the current regulations and how the overlay districts would um, impact their interpretation in particular about would the overlay be considered part of a residential district and would that mean that, for example, telecommunication towers would not be permitted within that area. Would it expand the distance from any residential district within which we would not allow telecommunications facilities outside of the residential zoning districts? Those are um, some of the issues that would be addressed in one of those new programs that um, I had mentioned in my presentation. Right. We're not attempting to uh, resolve that in the housing element, per se. Okay. Um, and as I said, the FCC has kind of precluded us in dealing with that as an environmental issue um, necessarily, but it is a concern that we are trying to address um, through those programs in the housing element would eventually be implemented. Okay. So that's being addressed elsewhere at this point. That's correct, because CEQA doesn't specifically call that out um, in its laundry list of environmental impacts. Um, so that's why it isn't specifically addressed in the draft initial study. Okay. The second um, question I have relative to the environmental study um, is regarding 
water or should I say liquefaction and or flooding, whatever. How are we addressing that? Um, there are a couple of different sections in the initial study that address both flooding and liquefaction. Um, portions of the TC1 district, including City Hall, um, are in an uh, undefined flood zone um, what was done specifically for City Hall when we did the remodeling here was there was a um, flood elevation study prepared um, to demonstrate that actually in a 100-year flood, the site would not um, be subject to inundation. Um, but something like that would have to be done then for any of those areas that we're talking about in the overlay, mm -hmm. mainly along Park Place, um, to clarify where the actual flood elevation would be in a 100-year flood and what measures would be necessary to um, protect persons and property from the impacts of flooding. Um, similarly, with liquefaction, there are areas of Crocker Park um, that are underlaying with, with clay, um, and that reacts differently to seismic events not necessarily liquefaction per se, but um, it may amplify um, certain um, vibrations. So a geotechnical report would be required for any particular project to develop um, to identify those measures that have to be included in the foundation design. Um, I don't know that it's necessarily required in Crocker Park per se, but there are areas of the city where, for example, pilings or piers have to be driven down into more solid um, soil or bedrock um, to stabilize a building and avoid the impacts of liquef liquefaction. Uh, I, I don't know that that's necessarily a concern for this particular area of Crocker Park, but that would be addressed through those studies. Okay, they were my two questions for now. Did you have any other questions? I don't. No? Okay. So then, I think it's time for us to open the public hearing. Um, I have one slip here from Dana. Do you want to start? Anyone else? Okay. Go ahead and brought us, uh, um, no. It's not a crowd. Oh, it's a small, it's a manageable <laughs> crowd. <laughs> I know who you are. Thank you, Madam Chairperson and Commissioners. Um, I thought I wouldn't have a lot of time. So I said a lot of work has been done, and it's some of it is wonderful. But because I have limited time to speak, I'll focus on the issues that I don't think are addressed. Um, the opening statement about a housing element needing to be in balance with land use, environmental, and other goals set forth in the general plan elements is true but it's not being achieved by this document, especially when you mention that the issues of potential building constraints, the very things that um, uh, Chairperson Cunningham um, is mentioning, they are numerous, uh, that will follow as part of the building code. The California Building Code does not supersede the city's due diligence required for this document of environmental review. And um, so if it were in balance, you would be passing a renewable energy, recreation, safety elements, and tidal rise plans, and all kinds of other things concurrently. But this is just the housing element separate from um, and not necessarily cohesive with the town. And I've stated over and over and over again the concern about bringing housing into former industrial areas. And Tr Crocker Park has been industrial. They have had um, spills. They had people pouring um, mercury into the um, um, drainage systems and um, other things. Anyway. Some of the information, in my opinion, is understated in terms of Brisbane having met low-income housing needs because of cohabitation and shared housing, as you guys have picked up on in HIP. I personally um, have a resident in my home from HIP, and what they do is they match people in need with people who have available rooms. Um, and 
they, I checked with my insurance company to make sure that it was okay in order to, um, so, you know, I didn't know there would be any city constraints because the city um, um, supports HIP housing. Um, you also, uh, because of uh, shared housing and people per possibly not using the permit process. Um, so you only have a, a, a kernel of information which might not be complete. There's no mention of the liveaboard units at the marina. Oh yeah, th there's nobody living there, but <clears throat> some of us know there are people living there. And therefore, when we state that we owe hundreds of units of housing as an unmeet needs shortfall, it's an unfair assessment. It's specious at best because it's not a complete uh, accurate statement and you shouldn't buy into it. Um, my n numbers don't correspond with your numbers, so I um, just, I called it figure HE1, mentions that the marina was considered for rezoning, but there's no mention in the earlier sections or what um, has happened with the things that were mentioned because somebody could look at this and say, oh, well, it's going to be allowed at the marina and all these other areas. And the reason I'm concerned about that is because what Tundex did, oh, excuse me, Universal Paragon did on the San Francisco side of the border was uh, study everything that they wanted but only ask for half of it. And then they came in later and asked for the other part back. And they said, well, we studied it. You didn't say no. So um, I'm concerned about the, the abuse of not studying this properly. And um, or um, in the case of this particular map, it has the appearance that you're going to rezone the marina and other areas. Um, and so I wonder why Appendix E, which should be a really beneficial document here, is a single sheet that says updating in progress. So how can we evaluate something of which we have nothing material? I, that, I don't know. I don't know how you can sit here and pass everything with a document that says updating in the process. Um, over the years, I have suggested that we redefine a unit because a family, when we were a family of three, can live in a 600 square foot home. So I find the size as one of the governmental constraints of the 1,000 square feet and would think that um, you, that's an area that you can revisit. And you mentioned Crocker, Technical, Crocker Park Technical Assistance Panel, which uh, came in a different uh, um, series. I don't see it attached here, but then it becomes a document for this. And um, the problem um, with that is that it's never undergone an environmental review, um, and you will be putting future residents at grave risk due to toxic fumes emitted by the existing units uh, uses. If you've been around Trillium Graphics, you know graphics requires a lot of um, um, fixatives and, and chemicals that are not that are cancer causing. And there's also prior unreported spills and underground storage tanks that haven't been um, remediated. Some historical document should be included in your um, in your documents here for those Park Lane places. Something so that you can have some sensibility that that you've done your adequate due diligence that this wasn't the you know that battery processing place or the soon to be battery processing places of the future. Um, I would hate for the city to have legal issues because housing looks good on paper, but the demons that lurk underneath in the form of carcinogenic and endocrine disrupting molecules. Uh, are being overlooked. Um, and so I did go to the environmental initial study, and I disagree with the assessments that are less than, um, an, an, what, less than significant. Oh. So we're not going to put sensitive receptors in this overlay zone uh, exposed to can, can the... 
diesel, fumes. Um, so uh, you don't think that the biological resources of clean water and the hydrological interruption of that area, because this um, Crocker Park used to be a, a um, marsh. And um, actually, somebody pointed out to me where the old ancient bed is and where the new bed is because um, there's different salts in the soil. And um, that, the place where it was pointed out to me is over near the, um, the area that Mountain Watch is. Um, the, the frog, the frog, habitat? frog habitat. Oh, okay. um, but you can see where the old marsh line used to be and where the new soil was brought in for Crocker Park. Um, so, the, and there are biological resources that now that it, the weeds have been cleared away, they keep popping up out of there going, oh, okay, we're down at the uh, water line, hydrological water line there. Um, I was in 100 Valley Drive during Loma Prieta. This area is very uh, unstable. Um, we actually even saw some of the roof lift, um, but that's building but it is subject to very strong ground shaking. That was 40 miles away. Um, and I don't believe that without um, conforming to the state's requirements of looking at um, tide water rising, that, um, that your assessment of the 100-year flood plain is accurate any longer. Thank you. Thanks, Donna. Would you like to come up? Would you please state your name for the record? Yeah. Um, hi, I'm Dave Hogan. It's spelled H-A-U-G-E-N. And I'm the regional vice president with uh, DCT Industrial Trust. Um, I manage Northern California for the company, and I'm responsible for the properties here in Brisbane. We are, I, I believe, maybe the second largest landowner in the city. We have 11 buildings in Crocker Park. Three of the five buildings that we're talking about that are affected by the overlay are buildings that we own and they're the three in succession um, along park. So um, I was involved in the ULI's technical assistance panel study. Um, I've read the report. Um, we think it's accurate. We like it. Um, we think what, what um, the staff has done is consistent with that, and we like it. So we're generally okay with what's here. Um, I, I did want to speak today because there's a couple concerns I have. Um, um, and they're basically in Chapter 6 under Goals and Policies. And HD2A and HD2B are addressing um, how the new residential overlay uses would interact with the current uh, Crocker Park zoning uses. And my concern has been that, that whatever happens um, with the overlay should be... Um, should be allowed to be fairly organic. So in other words, let, let's let economics um, dictate when um, the housing gets built and um, and be consistent with the new overlay. And we have no problem with that. That's great. Um, I just don't want to have um, the overlay and any ordinances that get passed as a result of it start impacting our ability to use the, the property per the TC1 zoning. So. I just raising this as a concern that I have. Um, I'm going to meet with staff. We're going to talk about it some more um, and see if we can come up with something that's that's um, maybe a little different than what's stated here in these two points. So I just wanted to let you guys know that that was my concern. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. Did you have any questions? I I wanted to know what's Hang on. Of, of, sorry. of the speakers before we close the public hearing. Oh, I thought you were asking. <laughs> <laughs> Did you have any questions for the speakers? No. no. Okay. Um, is there anybody else who'd like to speak? <clears throat> okay, then I make a motion to. Uh, no, actually, I wanted some more information from him. Oh. I'm, I'm sorry. Yeah. I'm just confusing everybody. Uh. Good. 
So I wanted to understand more about your concerns. I, I was listening and, and I wanted to hear more, you know, to give us more. Yeah, so, so if, you, if you look at the allowable uses in the current zoning, uh -huh. which is TC1, um, there's, a, there's a myriad of uh, companies that can come in and, and use the property, and that's the way it's been since the inception of the park. Mm -hmm. um, when, when there's a different use um, allowed in a park, it, in our opinion, it should generally be complementary or said another way, it should be additive. So if you said, look, you can do these 20 things here and we've been okay with it for the last 40 years, and then, you, and then to come in and say, well, now it's no longer okay, but we're really okay with residential, um, our, that's not our preference. Our preference is to say the original allowable uses should still be allowed. Um, so, so let me understand what you're saying. Um, so you're saying that what you want is if the, the structure itself can be torn down and replaced with another structure and still have the same use? Is that what you're saying? Or to continue with the same structure um, and rent that out and continue to rent it out until such time that um, it is going to be uh, changed for housing or someone comes in to buy the property for housing? Is that what you're saying? Well, yeah, I guess there's two issues there. So yeah. if, if one of the buildings um, suffered a fire, as an example, uh -huh. and it burned down, um, there's there's the possibility that we wouldn't be allowed to build and, and reuse it as it is used today. So that's a concern. And so by doing an overlay, which allows the housing to be additive use, would allow us to rebuild what's there and continue using it as an industrial property per the TC1 zoning. So, um, so obviously that's one concern. Um, most people don't focus on that. Um, the, the other um, concern is and I'm not sure it's a concern. Maybe I may not understand your question totally, but but the first point you made is a concern of ours. We should be able to continue to repair and maintain whatever it takes to keep the property marketable, to make mm -hmm. it um, attractive to the market and where a tenant would want to house his business there. Um, the other issue, if I'm understanding your question, is um, I'm completely okay with, with someone coming in and saying, hey, I think the land's worth X, and I'm willing to pay you X, and what I'm going to do with it um, is consistent with the zoning, including the residential overlay. And that would be a typical, um, a, a typical situation where somebody could come in and let and let the market economics and demand um, drive what gets built there. Um, we've seen we've seen examples where um, that's not the case, and what happens is 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 the owner of the existing industrial building cannot backfill his space um, with the uses that were previously allowed, and so there's a there's a uh, a metamorphosis of the types of uses that are allowed in the building, and then and that impacts value, and um, and that's something we we would not like to see happen. Um. So I wanted to ask staff, my understanding is that the um, business can continue to be a business until such time that someone wants to buy the property and, um, and change the zoning. Is that correct or not? Are you talking under the proposed policy language or what, what do you... When we rezone. Yeah, basically... That would be correct. If someone wanted to buy the property and redevelopment for residential use, they'd be able to exercise that under the the residential overlay zone because that would come with its own standards and its own requirements for the conversion of that site or those sites to residential purpose. And then uh, what about the issue if there is a fire and they have to rebuild and retrofit or... Um, that is not a problem, is it? That's it, correct. Even under I mean, even our non-conforming sort of regulations, those kind of issues would not typically occur. Uh, but yes, under the under the sort of concept that's on, in play right now, yeah, they'd be able to rebuild what they have and rebuild something consistent with the industrial category uh, aspect of the TC zone. And and that's and that's 
we appreciate that and uh -huh. we worked hard to try to make sure all this works and it's it's working so um that's why i said we're, we're we're happy with how things are are coming together um it's just the, those one two those those two sections that i mentioned to you um we just want to make sure that that doesn't impact future users so that's my, my goal to keep that from happening so one, one of the parts of our discussion was always about not taking right that was very important to this yeah. whole process exactly right. yeah, and we've had that conversation yeah. too okay yeah it, and we're, we're all on the same page yeah. yeah through the chair i think the issue that's probably the most it's going to probably take the most um massaging mm -hmm. is not so much the treatment of the of the properties in question but the idea of creating zoning standards that would be applicable to adjacency so if you say you retain the existing zoning for tc you know outside the overlay area i think what we're looking at you know we've all been in this situation and all experienced that you've experienced it at this commission and the the conflict between residential use and industrial use and the idea of getting out ahead of that trying to put some some uh, reasonable kind of uh, consistency requirements but that gets into the issue i think that the the gentleman's bringing up dave's bringing up here the idea of if you start putting certain restrictions within x many feet of a future residential overlay that's you know that's the issue i think that we haven't fully addressed i think we talked about a future zoning case we don't know all the language on that and then i think that's really what what you're bringing up david i don't put words in your mouth but that i think is the issue at hand well this this is also part of what we talked about relative to what was going on in san francisco you know existing businesses were in place like them or not and then around them was zoned for residential and then the residential people complained about the existing businesses and the existing businesses were closed down and that's one thing we were very careful about talking about whether we like your businesses or not it's not coming in and dictating that you're going to change right your tenants right. because um, we're i mean our process here is to identify it's not to actually do correct correct this is policy language um, and I think you're absolutely correct. There's nothing in like, anybody's expectation of what these regulations would be, but it would get into change of use issues, adjacency. If, if there's a certain user, that's fine, and they'll continue in perpetuity. But you know, the question is, if those businesses were to change hands or go into a different use, would there be a desire to have some other um, parameters with in proximity to residential but I mean that's really the issue at hand and we haven't addressed it in any kind of detail other than the identify it as sort of an issue of concern mm -hmm. and may, maybe ultimately the the Commission the council decide that's not you know that is that balance between property rights of existing uses and, and new users and maybe they decide not to change any of it that's an outcome too I think we're just kind of raising it as a potential issue at this particular moment in time yeah, we we didn't we didn't want it to go down the path without talking about it. Sure. No, absolutely. Yeah. Do you have any more questions, Carolyn? No, but thank you for your clarification. Do you have any questions? Yeah. Thank yeah. You. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Then, Dana, did you have anything else you wanted to add before I close the public hearing? Okay. Got it. Okay. Then I make a motion to close the public hearing. A second. All in favor? Aye. Okay, moving forward. Thank you very much. Um, items initiated by staff. Um, through the chair, I think you need to oh, decide on that. what you're actually okay, doing. Okay, sorry about item. that. Hello. Uh, and uh, I think I think there was one comment made about appendix whatever appendix E E um, that has been. Um, I believe it was on your places today. I don't I don't know if it was put in the public I, packet I or not. We haven't looked at it. Um, I, don't, I don't think it was in the packet. It wasn't in the packet. I believe no. it was placed on the dais in front yep, of you. Right. Through, through the chair, it, it, it essentially, it, it's, it, it was on your uh, desk this evening, and the, the packets that were out here had it, but the original packets that went out last week did not yet. It's a supporting document to Table 35, and so it gives the details of how the, the numbers break out. But it's uh, 
So did we want to um, carry this over until we have a chance to study document um, E, Appendix E? I'd prefer to have some time to look it over. I don't have a problem with that. I agree. Okay. Um, so, the next meeting. And, and also, I, I, I want to think about what uh, Dana had to say. Um, so that would, that would give me a chance to to reflect on what. And if I could were. respond to yeah. her comments, you, yeah. you might want to actually Is carefully that, read through the initial study um, because there are actually sources cited right. um, that I, I'm, I'm uh, address both uh, the potential for hazardous um, materials in the area and sea level rise. Mm -hmm. Okay. And liquefaction. Right. So then I, I guess what we need to do is make a motion to continue this to the regular meeting of September 11th. Great. Um, I make a motion. I second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. Okay. So moving on. Two items initiated by staff. I only have one item and you may or may not be aware that the uh, commission's action in approving the design permit for 7000 marina avenue was appealed by two council members so that will be set for council review of that appeal so sometime uh, the date's not fixed yet i don't have a date but as soon as i know actually we'll be back on the 11th to the commission with the report of your decision which then gets transmitted formally to the council so I just wanted to give you a heads up on that. Thank you. Thank you. Anything else? Uh, any items initiated by the commission? None. No. And obviously no subcommittee updates. Do we have any news on you'll, anything? You'll be, we have uh, September 3rd third next Wednesday set um, mm -hmm. you'll be getting an agenda tomorrow okay so. got it thank you uh, with that I I make a motion to adjourn to the regular meeting of September the 11th uh, 2014 at 7 30 p.m. I second so does the roost I thought I turned it off all in favor aye aye thank you I don't even know where it is. Already?